there was a, a group of guys that uh, would battle every every Friday. That, like it was like a fight, you know, like oh so and so and so and so are fighting at three o'clock, you know. I would watch that all the time. I would watch those guys do that, and uh, I was just so intrigued, you know, always being a part of the hip hop culture. I was born in Chicago, but I've been here since I was like four years old. So my introduction to hip hop happened in Minnesota. I remember being at one of my friends' house, you know, when you were young. You know, it was like the big sleepover thing, and um, his dad was playing Run DMC. And uh, back then, I didn't know what it was. It was like in '83 or something like that, and he was playing this CD. Or this tape. It was a tape because they hadn't made CDs yet. And I was like, what is this? And we we were playing games like Monopoly and all kind of stuff. And I kept on saying, play that tape again. I like this. So I would go home and I'd be singing, it's like that. And that's the way it is and all that. But show, you got to ask him. You got to be like, yo, what's your definition of type? Because I think our opinion is different. It was, um... 95, 96. That's when I started getting into like a lot of West Coast artists. Like I was into hieroglyphics, freestyle fellowship, and just the kind of the people that were playing with their voice more. And just like doing, you know, being more of like a vocal personality, like, you know, just being more dynamic. And I remember actually watching headshots going, this is just like the stuff on the records, but you can see it. <laughs> I was probably like 12 or 13 and rap made its way into the radio in my father's car just because it would get played on black radio in between Earth, Wind and & Fire and Sade. It wasn't until like Run DMC came out when I realized that this was not my father's music. This, these guys are talking to me and my friends. And then it became a neighborhood thing. You know, like so many of the kids in my neighborhood just got into it. We all got into breakdancing, we all got into graffiti. I saw beatboxing, breakdancing, graffiti, uh, and all that, and I was like, what is this? You know, it just kind of grabbed me, and then I remembered seeing a video with Run DMC in it, and it had all that in it. So then I made the connection, I was like, this is like, this is something you're supposed to be doing, you know what I'm saying? I was one of those kids who would practice acceptance speeches for awards, and you know, as corny as that sounds, whatever, you know, this is my dream. I see the more in touch or out of touch I get with this kind of plight to be a musician that I just care less and less about what it's called. To me, yeah, I'm always making hip hop. I'm, I'm a hip hop person. That's what I grew up with. That's what made me want to make music. If I'm rapping over dogs barking, it's hip hop. If I'm screaming over dogs dying, it's good hip hop. Technically, it's a music, like I said, started with drum machines and sampling. But what are you sampling? They weren't sampling hip hop, you know? They're sampling anything. They're doing anything. And so that's what's kind of neat about it. Also, I just said neat, by the way. You might have to edit that out and put in a tougher word, like, fucking cool hip hop. Comes from the neighborhoods, comes from the struggles, comes from the poverty, comes from, you know, whatever experiences and influences the people who created it were going through at that time and that's black and latin america in new york a lot of dirty grimy chopped up beats come from that and a lot of people always told me oh wait till you visit new york and then you'll understand and i never understood until i visited new york you know i mean it's nothing but you know, you always hear the concrete jungle, and it's, I mean, it's nothing but buildings. And, you know, to come from somewhere like Minnesota with trees, and I can drive 10 minutes away from here and not see a building. You know, I could drive 20, 30 minutes away and probably see a cow. You know what I'm saying? These guys got hours of industry. You know, to be in the middle of Times Square and just be, you know what I'm saying? 
That would drive you insane. You know, so if you really understand why everything moves the way it moves in their music, you, it makes you understand why Minnesota hip hop is the way it is. It's a little bit happier. Stop, hold it, breathe, now. It's a really big small town, and the scenes become very incestuous. Everybody has been in bands with everybody, everybody has played on bills with everybody. And I think that kind of keeps us all in this confined space where the artists in the city are forced to create for themselves and for their community as opposed to conceptually try to create for the masses. And then you have these horrendous winters that pretty much put everybody in their home for six months and make you not even want to leave your house. And so you really have no choice but to make shit and create shit. A lot of the West Coast shit is good for, a, for freestyle sessions based on that it's more like, if you live in the West, it's warmer. It's nicer, you're more like, ah, it's kicking it, you know? When you leave, live in cold climates, it's more it's more on the grind, it's more like, you know, cold, you have to worry about being warm more, it's just, it's more tunnel vision, I think. But really, nothing's better or worse, they all have their own flavors. As long as it has the proper rhythm, you know, the kicks and the snares and the hi-hats are all working together. But then it's also about dropping it at the appropriate time for the appropriate MC or DJ, or just the appropriate person. When I first got into hip hop, it was about just being tough, you know, asserting your, if you will, testosterone, manhood. So when I rap, a lot of times it's really aggressive. It just comes from the competitiveness of being the best at what you do, just being hungry. And, and that's what I am as an MC. I'm hungry. I'm just ready to eat any and every all the time. See, because I'm not a small dude, so you know, sometimes I want a woman with a little meat on her. I wrote a little song about it. Here it goes. I got a fat girl on my jock. I got a fat girl on my jock. Yes, I got a fat girl. Oh my jock, I got a fat girl. Are you shocked? I'm not exactly your little nigga. So why but I'll be looking for a woman with a brittle figure? I got a woman who can survive the flop when I ride the top. Not ashamed to go to Mickey D's and supersize the fries and pop. One who doesn't lie a lot about the way and fine with the fact that she gets out of shape. Raising niggas in a way to the fixing of an easy. To prepare a meal greasy and cheesy. Lactose intolerance swallowing gallons of milk. Kills dairy products and gets farts. Walking upstairs, the sweat starts and I'm always finding areas will never see before stretch marks. Come with the rub pumps of the fat but some fat breasts can be flating air mattress and much lust it brings when she's lying naked on a bed with crush busted springs stressed by how long this vocal's taking me time to leave before the closing of the local bakery at a sitting kid in just a beat stack staring at my food like are you gonna eat that but i must say what i really take the hate is when she got her stubby fingers all up in my dinner plate we fight and i call her large margin mother blubber but never a fat bitch because i love her to me, 
there's a way to do this, this rap thing. There's a sound that this rap thing has. And a lot of this, the newer things are bringing elements into it that aren't from that foundation. Does that mean it's right or wrong? You know, I can't be the judge of that. There's not fans anymore, you know, everybody wants to be a participant. So when I'm up there doing my thing, you got all these hecklers that think they're capable of doing what you're doing and they want to grab the microphone. It's like that, you see, we can do it all. Grab the microphone and do this shit, soak my balls. I won't do that, cause that's kind of all. But when I grab the microphone, you know I'm rapping it back, and I never go out with this shit. Put my lasa in la casa. Every time I do this shit, your girl is kind of spicy like salsa. I like brown skin people. This is what we do. Yeah. The microphone that's coming through for my crew. Yo, I never wear a crown. I always wear a smile upside down. You understand how I'm coming? What I have to clown? I got the money to lock us out the style. When I grab the microphone, it's worth the time for me. Wow, I can do this shit right here. Yo, I got this drum tree in here. You understand the way that we do it, Christmas tree. Even when the beat drops out, I still rock Never without a doubt Always with that clear shot For man abilities, all the fucking hands yeah. Me and this kid got the fastest damn hands yeah. In the fucking hip hop game Yeah, yeah, put your hands up I never begged to grab nobody's microphone and that's one of the, the biggest things about this label and the people that we're affiliated with. We never begged nobody for a microphone. We made microphones available to ourselves. Five, four, three, two, one. Well, I'm gonna tell you some shit about the headache and some shit basically telling about the local hip hop in Minnesota. People were like, Minnesota, what's that? Well, we got some shit going on for you, you know what I'm saying? The Twin Cities hip hop scene is very close knit. There's not like this abundance of stuff going on where it's like, oh, it's just moving so fast. I don't know who's who. It's like, there's very few people who are actually being recognized. I'm sure there was a lot of people like in their house that were into hip hop and stuff like that. But there's very few people that were out doing shows and stuff. And I didn't even know there was such a thing as like a local CD. Yo, grab a pencil, three pads and a notebook, you still shook like below zero. Painting mirrors by the train track, it's enough skills that you like. So fuck you, your crew in your backpack, I'm fat. Spear my man, yo, I spent a better portion of my years as a vandal. I'm too hot to toy with these b-boys, get lifted off the scent that I consume. I catch a buzz until I bug from sniffing market fume. The slug is coming with this motherfucking verbal psychosis. And I'm allergic to your flow, bitch. Running is my nose, it's the diamond tap addict. I rhyme this bad at shit. I bust pitches and tag the bus bitches. I'll let your mom rub her nipples on my retina before I try to see ya. I flow just like diarrhea shit. I might get pizza if your skills is prominent. But if you whack, won't even waste my time bombing it. I wanna risk your ego, elated by this cannabis. So I'ma grab a sharp jacket stick and I'ma stab you in the pancreas. Can't reach it. All sign one big fat contract. I said yeah, cause I was buzzed from the contact. I ransacked this damn track. And even if your man's whack, I give that kid his credit if his heart is in it. Plus I rip apart the cynics. My vibe is optimistic. I got you twisted in the brain. More game than Mr. Lake. So tell me who's the snake, bitch. I'm spacious. All you fucking fake kids make me wanna break shit. So take this. Rhyme Sayers was originally a group called Headshots, and that was just very primitive, very raw form of what we have now. Um, there was no like business; it was just like this group of rappers and DJs and b-boys and shit like that. Just give props to Headshots crew, it's my crew, y'all, native ones, full circle atmosphere. Beyond abilities, beyond <laughs> Me. illusion, illusion, <laughs> illusion, extreme, <laughs> trying to illusion. talk, and these cats are out here talking shit. But nah, Battle Cats breaking crew. What they would basically do is do these kind of like open mic coffee house nights where they would all perform, they'd freestyle, do songs from here and there. And that's when I first witnessed like a live. Rap, it blew me away, actually. Watch as it all gets unleashed as we release the peace inside of what we use. Piece by piece, just as long as each one teaches something to the next one. We can all get along, we can all sing this song. We can all... I mean, when Rap Series started, there was only four of us. It was me, Musab, Stress, and Ant. And we did it out of necessity, not because we had this plan. But it was, it was that Minneapolis shit. It was like, look, we have to do this ourselves because nobody outside of here really cares about what we're doing. And so that, that was it. That was all it was. I remember 
the first day I met um, Slug. One of the crews at the time was Full Circle, um, one of the original Headshots groups. We were we were freestyling at one of their friends' house. We were all standing there in this living room around this coffee table. Somebody was beatboxing, I think, and we were all freestyling, or there was some beats in the background or something. And uh, he had his cap on real low, couldn't see his eyes or nothing. And had like a work jacket on with, you know, a little name tag or whatever. And then just started freestyling and I was like, damn, that dude's tight, you know? It was really cool, a really cool experience because everybody that opened their mouth was on an equal playing field. And I was like, damn, everybody in this room is dope. I think um, the key to what we've done is that we kept it exactly how it was when it was just the four of us. We only work with artists that we believe in as people as opposed to artists that we think are talented. The talent is secondary to just humanity. Rhyme Sayers' sound comes from the artist in whatever direction we decided to take it in. There's no formula to what we do, and that's the beauty of, of the label. I don't come in here to work, I don't call, go to the back office and say, look, Los Nativos wants to do a new record, and have somebody in the back office go, okay, well, it needs to sound like this. This is the new Rhyme Sayers sound. You need to sound like this. No, it's the exact opposite. Do what you do is what we're told. Do what you do and do it well. Tore this whole set yeah. down, so I burned this yeah. house down to the ground And I said, this is my town, yeah. this is my sound The way it comes out the speakers We looked at that cat, made him feel weaker yeah. Just from the glare when I stare Oh no, these motherfuckers trying to mess with me Cause the long hair, I don't switch like a bitch Why you trying to front on me? Pulling big qualities, one of the illest MCs And when he just uh, ducks, when he do that first punch I came up from behind him and I ate his ass for lunch With a right and a left and a big upper cut And his whole crew was like, what the fuck, we just got I know judo, you know what he think about me I had to hit him with a left and I kicked him with my knee It's like that fact Beating rappers down, waiting for beats to pound Because you know well, that what happened was, uh, there was this, uh, silence <laughs> Everybody got scared because it was like That kid I did, and Felipe's up in here What should we do? Let's run around, let's just stop <laughs> There's no way that we can battle with them and get props And so they all stopped They stood in the corners and waited They waited, they waited, heavily sedated And they got <laughs> real faded But the second the beat came in and this motherfucker played it I grabbed the microphone, took his dopest rhyme And I ate it, I ate it And I had to say, man, your crew is weak and I hate it Idea was really young when I first met him He was probably 14 or 15 And he would come to the shows He was a break dancer He was part of a crew called the Battle Cats And they would all come to the shows and dance at the shows and stuff and um, he was good friends with a friend of mine, a kid named Sess, who was a rapper from a group called The Abstract Pack. And somewhere when Idea was like 15 or 16, and I must have been about 25, Sess died in a car accident. And it hit Idea super hard. I mean, it hit all of us really hard, but it really hit Idea because he was a lot younger and he really looked up to Sess and, and pretty much followed Sess around. And after that happened, Idea became a lot more serious about rapping. And it was incredible because it was almost like Sess was channeling through him because Idea at 15 all of a sudden was incredible. And he sounded like Sess, he rapped like Sess. He was able to do things that Sess did that nobody else in the city could, could fuck with, especially on the freestyle. Me, idea, and abilities kind of clicked in like a sibling way where I just started kind of looking out for them, you know, even outside of rap, you know, just making sure that they ate 
and making sure that you know they were taking care of themselves and stuff like that. It just kind of grew naturally from there into me and him rapping together and making songs together. And then the next logical step was like, hey, do you guys want to come on the road with me because I get to tour, and if you guys come with, it's good exposure for you so that you can eventually branch off and go do your own. on some musical ideas, you know, and you just start working on them. Like we bought a four track, started laying down songs, bought a beat machine before that, obviously, started making songs, started doing shows, started doing open mics, started doing DJ battles, started doing battles. You know, it all kind of just happened. Yo, Chicago, what's up? Y'all ready to see what's happening? Now come on, make some noise. You ready to see what's happening? To be a DJ and or turntablist is so expensive. It's just not something you can just jump into. Like I could rap because it's like I could afford paper <laughs> and you know, whatever. But Technique 1200s are like 500 bucks a piece. And then you gotta get a mixer too. So he had a record collection and that was it for a long time. And he was just like, yeah, I DJ, but he didn't really DJ. He just had some records. When he first got a turntable, and he got it through one of the Headshots guys, a group called Full Circle, I think gave him his first turntable. Oh, we have an extra one laying around. Man, we were like, what? A studio? A turntable? Holy shit. You have one? You have one we can use? You know, Max didn't have furniture. He had an apartment on Grand with no furniture, and he had one of those like egg carton things you lay on beds. That's what he was sleeping on. He would fold that up and put his knees on it and he had one turntable and then a generic Gemini mixer. Uh, no speakers or anything. Out of the turntable mixer, headphones. And I swear to God, you can ask Felipe this too, it seemed like within a month he was the best DJ ever. Before that he hardly touched turntables. And he sat down on his knees and scratched. <laughs> There was a period of time where they got so, you know, when people saw them, they thought of them as part of atmosphere, and they weren't given the chance to really establish their own identities. And so after about two years of touring with me, there was a little bit of frustration with that, which eventually turned into a kind of like sibling resentment, and which turned into us like, you know, always bickering at each other. And that's when it was like, okay, now it's time. You guys fucking go, go do your thing. DJ is a drum. It's a real trial. You know, that is the drums to, you know, to lead the people, to keep them going. I mean, it's kind of bizarre because I've created an element where I'm a drummer. I need to have the beat. I need to direct. I need to conduct. But then at the same time, I'm one of the lead instruments. It's like I am a vocalist because with my cutting, I'm completely expressing myself, talking, I'm rhyming. 
You know, I'm not necessarily rhyming with my vocals, but I am rhyming completely. Yeah. But then I'm also drumming for myself. One of the beautiful things about DJing is it can go backwards. Any, any other instrument, you hit keys, chords, you know, or you're hitting drums, but turntables, it goes forwards and it goes backwards. And it's not limited by 88 keys. I really think DJing, specifically scratching more turntable based shit, but it's all DJ shit, you know, is another step for like jazz energy. Because it's all based on supreme instrumental improvisation, you know, just being able to just get up there and just feel it, feel what's going on. And, and I feel like when I hit that and it's right with the beat and it's timed out correctly and the volumes are good. I mean, just when everything's good. Max, I remember there was actually this one, um, when he first got the, the EPS keyboard, which is what he made um, some of the older stuff on. When he first got it, he, he made this drum kind of thing where the kicks and snares didn't land like where they're supposed to traditionally, you know? Like the kick on the one, the snare on the two repeat. It was so off the wall, but I just remember him being like, this is it, isn't this the shit? And just being like, I, I don't know, I don't think so, but maybe it is, let's try it. We used to try all kinds of shit. And then from the beginning, I was always like, I didn't want to write songs about writing songs. I, I was like writing about strange shit. So our really early stuff is, is way more conceptual than anything else that like people can buy. Firstborn was like a tamed down version of some of the conceptual shit we had. There was not one song that was just like, hey, we're here and we're doing things. It was always like, I'm gonna rhyme about being a TV program, trying to influence you to do so and so, and then he'll take the beat and like, you know, I don't know, it's just always creative stuff. Step into heaven's gates, anxious to see what God's got to say. Maybe he'll give me a gift for always saying my prayers. But he might send me downstairs for last year's love affair. Well, you know what? Who cares? You know, because right now it's all a mystery. I mean, I'll find out when I get there. Until then, I can't let it get to me. I'm keeping my cool. Besides, everybody dies. I'll just follow the white light like they do in the movies. It seems like hours went by and I'm still traveling right towards the brightness. Now this ain't heaven or hell, this realm is lifeless. And I hate to say it, but this wild goose chase had me bored. No directions, no clues, and no idea what I was in for. But then forward I kept floating, and then a quick flash. The light split directly in half and created a forked path. Representing each side was an angel. Now what's the task I have to untangle to meet the big man in charge, I asked. And the one to the right of me said, one of us always lies and one always tells the truth. Ask the right one the right question and he'll direct you to heaven. But if you ask the wrong one, son, farewell. He going straight to, well, y'all get the picture. Now the stuff that I'm writing, I don't even want it to mean anything specific. I'm just coming up with sentences that mean 10 different things. And to me, that's good writing. Like if you can do, if you can do like triple meanings 
and use the right words and be very simple and very subtle and make it mean enough, that's awesome. Like, I'm a big fan of very short sentences right now, very simple rhymes and just really kind of off-the-wall stuff. Once you stamp it into the world of being a recorded or painted or written thing, it's no longer true, no matter what. Even if you tell the story completely 100%, it's now a fabrication. And so once you realize that, you can draw from anything. I could turn the person into a unicorn if I wanted to, you know? I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run From the voice of reason till it turns to laughter My dance will masquerade like I don't believe in the morning after Chronicles contain a few hidden chapters We keep our mirrors dirty in case vanity backfires A low brain curtains on the pain's unique in this And one throw you can expose the love my weakness There's somebody in your hands got my ways burn insane So you learn to let through what we don't know what else is. Mistake is just a lesson that hadn't been learned yet or something to that effect. And I was like, that's pretty cool. You know, if you fuck up, it just means you needed to fuck up to realize that's not what you should be doing. In general, I'd say most of our recorded um, material is just kind of like these mistakes and experiments that we've been making. And I kind of feel like it'll always be like that. There's no kind of solid movement. There's no one thing that really is it. We're just kind of always, you're basically looking at all the different kind of experiments that we've tried. I mean, ENA is an experiment. That whole record is an experiment. It's just kind of like, looking back on it, it was like, well, let's try this. Let's try this. I know as far as production wise, I'm definitely not where I want to be. I mean, I'm, I don't think I'll ever be where I want to be at. But I for sure wasn't like, I know exactly what I'm doing. I was just like, maybe I'll try this. Maybe I'll try that. Maybe I'll try that. I feel like that's how I probably was with the lyrics as well, because he writes lyrics to beats. I always know that I can spend 12 hours a day working at something and I'll never, I'll never, I'll never master writing. I'll never master my voice. I'll never master the piano. That's amazing to think about. So it's like, you're always growing. Oh shit! Why don't you introduce yourself so everybody knows what's going on? This is my name this is, is Carnage, y'all. I know what part is right. I'm 
know who we ripping the ripping the fuck about every time that they pass up on the fucking fuckers. I'm gonna take your fucking money away. I met ID and Abilities in 1997. I was doing a show at First Ave, and um, they happened to be there. And um, me and some of my crew members were doing something. And then they came up to us and were like, yo, you guys are really good. You inspire us. And then I remember looking at them like, yo, you guys, little shorties or whatever. Then later on, I seen them doing their thing. And I was like, whoa, them were the dudes I seen back in the days or whatever. Those are the two guys I, I officially knew first with Rhyme Sayers. Yo, what time did you guys have like a phone and thumb members of shit ripping the shit in half? You're the crap over the psychopath. Fuck it, niggas, I'm moving on the steps. sessions at this little hole in the wall club slash restaurant called Bon Appetit. When we were first starting to get our names, that's where everybody went to perform. It was like the only place where everybody could perform. Um, Idea would come down there and I would be down there a lot. And we do impromptu freestyle sessions together and all that all the time. And then one time he had a dictaphone and he was like, yo, we should go outside and freestyle. You know, we can hear the beats from outside. So we went outside and, um, you know, he's freestyling and he's holding it to his mouth freestyling and I'm standing next to him. And then when it's my turn to rap, he put it in my face. And, and um, that was the first thing we ever really officially recorded. Actually, I'm doing a doing a new um, record where I'm doing all the production. So I produced that beat, recorded and engineered it, did it all. And, um, you know, it's, it's really meaningful to me, some of the stuff that I'm doing nowadays, because I'm making it um, solely, you know, by myself. When he was getting ready to do his album in 2001, he called me up. He was like, come over here. I got something for you. So I'm sitting there, and he's like, uh, I got the song I want you to be on called Coaches. And um, I was like, okay, so what is it all about? He said, first of all, I got this freestyle that you and I did like three years ago, and it is so tight, and I want to put it at the beginning of the song to showcase you. And I was like, oh, man, that was probably some bullshit. That shit was whack. He was like, I don't think you're going to say that. He played it, and I was like, oh, shit. I did that? Okay, let's use it. DJ, no one like a boo shines With needle to wreck a method, nigga, in two times My DJ, on dicks and cut the you fine He's plenty ill skill, maybe Jimmy two times The DJ element really excited me So at first I wanted to be a DJ And the rapping thing didn't, I mean it was cool But it didn't turn me on as much I really liked that DJ thing it was just, I just like to see, you know, DJs on the turntables and, and Ice T, you know, he had like three DJs and it was just real cool. So I was like, if I ever do this thing, I want to be a DJ. And then I tried it and I sucked ass. I was totally whack. I couldn't pull the record back right. And I thought, you know, me liking it so much would translate into true ability. And it didn't. So I was like, I'm not good. So maybe I should just write raps. Give him the tallest respect. Y'all is a mess. Record moves all in your chest. Call up the next. Challenger, Excalibur, will he lose abilities? And Jimmy got me, the DJ in an MC's body. The work with all of them, the definite best. When we came up, you just had to be good. It wasn't about just rapping because it was fun. You had to be tight. So a lot, a lot of times I see raw rappers that ain't tight, and I'm just like, man, somebody should battle these dudes or something because, you know, when I was coming up, I mean, people used to get beat up if you weren't tight. Like, people would boo you. But I am starting to get more personal with it. Um, I'm thinking that people will get to know me better if I tell a little bit about what I've been through. So I'm getting more into that, you know, sprinkling a little bit of my stuff with what it is that makes me an aggressive rapper. You got your pistol with you, take it out. Do what you love. Who busts the slugs? I said, if you got your pistol with you, take it out. Who cut the dust? Shoot up the club. You bust a dog. It's an Indian to the gym. Nigga, we will let your red letter and make your definition irrelevant. Peddling intricate synthesis. But I swallow it, bitch, and bitch, and I send the gym to my fellow menaces. And you finish it. Head man, I'm out of the house. Pump the house. Let your brain drag it in. Blood and mouth. Break it down inside. Salivary glands. Make it proud when rhyme calibrating hands. Everything about me is a pimp.
interior From the voice and the flow to intestinal material So when I take a shit, I look phenomenal Got a mother, daughter, date, bisexual, gotta go started we weren't dope we were just good people that really wanted to do this you know and here we are 13 years later still kind of keeping that as our foundation and it's brought us to incredible people rhyme sayers has got to be one of the most diverse underground hip-hop labels and fan bases that there is in, in the hip-hop game right now Every person is an individual expression, but we all are part of one big thing as well. So I'm just trying to articulate harmony through my eyes and hands and ears. You could argue that there's such thing as natural talent, I don't really know. But I know that the people that wind up doing something significant, whether they have talent in the beginning or not, is not important. What's important is how determined they are. You gotta try hard if you wanna do something, and you have to be honest with yourself. You will never be happy if you're trying to be somebody else, ever. You gotta be yourself, look at yourself objectively, and go where you wanna go. Whatever you do becomes a part of the culture. And that's what resonates the most with me. I'm on one path, and hip hop embodies that whole thing. I live it every single day. When I get up, that's what I'm thinking about. Hip hop, hip hop. Everything that encompasses me is hip hop. I think what sets us apart, what sets everybody that we kind of associate with apart is we do what comes natural to us. So there's no gimmicks involved, there's no hidden agenda. It, we, we wear our heart on our sleeve and that's it. Grab the microphone next up so hard. Oh, 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 oh